All right, folks, John Kelly, welcome back. Law Enforcement Life Coach with your Sometimes Heroes Need Help podcast. Guys, I got Dr. Travis Yates. Doctor. Now, <laughs> when you say doctor, not wearing a lab coat, kids. No. no. He, he, he is a, a, a badass man full of passion for this law enforcement thing of ours. He's a leadership influencer, an author, speaker, trainer. He has always been on the cutting edge of, of doing what is right for this profession. And we're blessed to have him with us here today. Chief Executive Officer of Courageous Police Leadership Alliance. We're going to be talking about leadership today. Uh, Safe TAC, Director of Training, been training thousands, thousands of law enforcement professionals around the country and around the world. And we're sitting down with him today wrote an amazing book, The Courageous Police Leader, A Survival Guide for Combating Cowards, Chaos, and Lies. And on top of all this, he's a full-time major with Tulsa Police Department. He's, the gentleman's got his plate full. So we'll be respectful of his time today, but without further ado, please help me welcome Travis Yates to the Law Enforcement Life Coach, Sometimes Heroes Need Help podcast. Travis, it's great to see you, brother. John, thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate you and everything you're doing. Oh, it's my pleasure, man. We, we, we've, got, we've got a similar mission, man. And, and, and when, when you meet people that care about our brothers and sisters out there still doing the job, um, you know, it, it, the, the, I think what they say, it takes a, a village to raise a child. It, well, it, it takes a lot of like-minded people in law enforcement to take care of our brothers and sisters. Yeah, I'm, I'm very, uh, very honored to know you and, and you know, seven or eight others that are kind of on the same go here to, to really make a difference. And, and uh, we have a real big leadership problem, but we have lots of people that are trying to point that out and to steer us in the right direction. And John, you play a big key in that. So I appreciate all you do. No, oh, it's my pleasure, Travis. Um, and, and let's jump right into it, man. Speaking yeah. about leadership and, and there, the tenants that make up a great leader are not mysterious. They're no. not, we don't need to climb uh, the, 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 uh, the Andes and, and go into a cave and find them somewhere uh, scrolled into a rock. No, no. And, and, and so, so, so the question begs, right? The question begs. Nobody's keeping this stuff a secret from anybody. There are countless books on leadership by people no. who, have, who have served our country, who have served in leadership roles in law enforcement, who have fought the good fight, who have made tremendous mistakes, right? And we've, we've learned from those mistakes. And we yep. say, hey, don't do this. It doesn't work. Do this. And we still find ourselves scratching our heads. Yeah. Yeah, that's the amazing thing. You know, John, I've been to, you name the leadership training. I've been very blessed in my agency, uh, FBI National Academy. I, I trained for IECP, police leader trainers for a long time. Uh, countless resources, countless books. I think m most in law enforcement are familiar with all those schools and training. And when, you know, several years ago, when you sort of started seeing the fabric of this profession break down based on just nothing, based on lies, based on things that were easily defendable, right? Things as simple as, oh, we can't fly the thin blue line or <laughs> all these silly things. It began to dawn on me that we have a lot of head knowledge in leadership. There's no shortage of what we know leadership is, but going from your head to your heart is a different story. And uh, the last thing I wanted to do was talk about leadership or speak on leadership or write on leadership. Cause I've, I've been that cop in the classroom where you're going, Oh my gosh, we're going to this class again. Yeah. And when you say the word leadership, most cops roll their eyes because they know it's bullshit. I'm telling you, most cops know that the people they work for oftentimes have been to all this stuff and they're worse off than when they went before. And so uh, it's funny, every time I walk in a classroom, in the first 15 minutes, you see their eyes go, oh, this is going to be different than what we're right. used to. Uh, they almost look depressed before you start because they're used to that typical cop class, right? right. And I think it's the, the difference is what we're trying to do here at the Alliance is we're trying to show you what real leadership is that can be implemented immediately that makes a difference versus oh, I have these certificates on the wall uh, or I've been to these schools or this training because quite frankly, I think it's pretty clear it hasn't worked. No, and, and, and that's, you, you hit the, the nail on the head there. There, um, 
there's no better training than experience yeah and, and being able to translate life experiences into workable solutions for our up and coming leaders i think is crucial um I, i'm getting ahead of myself you, you, you touched on your background a little bit travis mm -hmm. um give give me the reader's digest version brother because i i don't i want i don't want to not give credit to to the enormity of the work that you've been doing up until this point well i think it's important to know and i tell everybody this i did not intend to do the things that i do now i mean i was i was a cop's kid what was it interested in going to law enforcement middle class family mom was a high school secretary my dad was a police officer and my interest was sports and athletics. I was going to college to go into some field like that. And then one night when I was 19, I went on a police ride along and I literally could not believe what I experienced. I, I remember asking the guy, I go, man, do you get paid for this? And he was like, oh yeah, we get paid for this. I said, I think this is what I want to do. You yeah, know? And so my life trajectory changed and um, wasn't even from uh, Tulsa where I work now, but they required a college degree at the time. This was 30 years ago, pretty unique. And so my dad really pushed me to a place that would, that valued that education. So man, just a 21 year old kid started doing the job and all I knew was to try to work hard. I didn't know anything about any of the stuff that I do now, mm -hmm. but what happened was uh, I got real big into uh evoc training, police driver training, uh, unbeknownst to me, kind of one of the first guys in the country started talking about that. I was over our program in Tulsa. And as I progressed through my agency and through the rank structure, I started noticing more things that needed change, which leadership was a predominant one. And so I started speaking a little bit about that and people would call me up and go, come talk to our agency. And I'd be like, why, what, what is that even a thing? What do you mean? Come talk right. to your agency. <laughs> and I said, no, a lot of times, I mean, I did, didn't even this whole training and speaking and writing. I, mean, I didn't even know what that was. And we're talking yeah. 25 plus years ago, but at one point I just decided to go, okay, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And so I traveled to the agency. And what I really loved about it was, is it doesn't matter where I was, whether it's a small department, big department, big city, large city. I mean, we were all kind of the same. We were all dealing with the same issues. Uh, and obviously there were a lot of issues even back then. And I enjoyed meeting people that did what I did. And it's just some of the greatest people in the world. So I really enjoyed that camaraderie. So I just started saying yes. And, uh, and long story short, man, I've been in, I think 47 States, three countries, uh, all over the place. Of course, at some point when your voice gets large enough, the, the mainstream media tries to go after you and people try to attack you. I've been in internal affairs more times than I care to admit because some somebody in New York City or Los Angeles didn't like what I said in some class or on some some news interview. And it just sort of proved to me that I was over the target, right? Like if people sure. are getting upset, then yeah, I must I'm, be saying I'm, something I'm getting that's close right. To, I'm, and, uh, I'm, I'm hitting a so, nerve. And so I, I just sort of found myself in this position. I didn't intend to set out and do it, uh, but it's really been a blessing of a lifetime. Uh, I really enjoy helping people. And I still, to this day, I'm, I'm traveling next week uh, in a couple of departments. I have no idea why anybody wants to listen to me, uh, but I, cause I know one day they won't want to listen to me, yeah. but it's really is an honor to uh, get to stand in front of folks and to try to help them with their agency or with their community. Yeah. Man, you know, it, it's uh it, it's not a secret, man. You're adding value. You, you, they're, they're better when they leave your presence, right? You've given them some skill sets, some tools, and maybe a different way of, of thinking about something. And uh, I, I think what you obviously you bring to the table is we can all point at problems, right? But you offer solutions. Well, and John, I know you do the same thing, but it's a really heavy burden for me because when I stand in front of a classroom, I'll tell them, listen, this goal is not to give you an entertaining day. We're going to do our best. If you don't go to work the very next day and think to yourself, I'm a little better today than I was before I went to that class, then I failed. And I need 100%. to know that. I mean, 100%. so I take that very, very seriously. People's time is precious. And if I have them for eight hours, I, I have to give them something that can help them. And the idea is hopefully that they can then go help others and we can start spreading that message. Yeah. And I think, you know, one officer at a time, one day at a time, you know, right. that's the, that's the way we get the thing back. Um, right. You know, I, right. I, I told you, you know, I had this little saying, man, things don't get messed up overnight, so they don't get fixed overnight and they get fixed by doing the grunt work, right. right. By, by rebuilding that foundation. And that's what's, that's what you're doing, going out there, speaking to the troops and and letting them know what strong, competent leadership looks like. 
Yeah. And I'm not an expert at all, but I've been very blessed to work around some really great leaders and some really bad leaders. I think everybody out there has, and you just have to take from the good and reject the bad and quit repeating what we see. I call what's going on in law enforcement incestual leadership, right? Like we see everybody out there listening in law enforcement has seen this. You've seen somebody you've known that's a great sergeant or great lieutenant. And they always tell you, man, if I ever get in these higher positions, I'm going to be different. And then they get in those positions and then all of a sudden they're the exact same way the other person was. And it blows my mind, right? It just becomes the default. It becomes easy. We really need change agents. We really need people to stand up to what's going on. And it's really, like you said, it's not complicated. No. Do what's right. Have sure. integrity. Treat people with respect. Support people when they need support. Right. Hold people accountable. This stuff is not complicated. It blows my mind that we're able to get away with uh, what we've done to our uh, men, men and women behind the badge. Yeah, and I, I think uh, fortunately or unfortunately, our our luck is running out because yeah, um, you know what do they call that? The chickens have come home to roost, and right right now, this is uh, a critical time in this profession. It's a critical. Yeah, time. I, I can't think of another time in the last fifty years. Uh, we're really not on the edge. I mean, John, if we were the private business, we'd be bankrupt, right? Oh, I mean, we goodness. would literally be bankrupt right now. And when I wrote the book in 2019, I actually started in 2017. It was almost a warning shot. Like I saw, I was oddly enough been able to look around there and see things. Like I started talking about the recruiting problem six, seven years ago, because I knew in 94, we hired a hundred thousand cops on the cops grant. They're all going to be leaving the profession. There's a, there's a less support publicly for law enforcement. People aren't coming to the profession. We have a new generation coming on board that doesn't, right. doesn't necessarily go into an entire career. And I started talking about it and people acted like I was crazy. They just didn't see it. And right. so I saw this leadership crisis uh, many, many years ago and nobody else seemed to see it. And so when I wrote the book, it was almost a warning shot. Hey, listen, we better start doing this or else. Well, now if I was to write the book and we actually are writing part two now, as I speak, okay. it's, we're in the middle of crisis. This is it. This we're this is what you just said. This is the 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 crisis point. We can go one way or the other. If we go the wrong way, John, moving forward, law enforcement may exist in the future, but will, will not be law enforcement. It will mm -hmm. be some perverted form of crime victims call the police and we show up an hour Social later to take a report. Advocacy or yeah, some, it's gonna some be nonsense. really strange. And who's going to suffer is going to be the community, which is who is suffering at this very moment. Isn't that the it, but that's the that, that's the uh, we shouldn't even need to make the argument. Look at your communities. Right. Ha, have they become safer with all right. the technology we have at our hands, right? Right have your communities become safer across the board they have not what what are we doing differently than you know you know yeah. we can look at the data or you can just do you feel comfortable walking down the street right you, you know right. it's it's you know you travel i travel you know i call the pd i go hey where I'm, i want to go out to dinner tonight before the you know, where am i not going you know right. because um and they'll tell you, oh, don't for God, you know, for the love of God, don't, don't, don't go down Eighth Ave, or you know, you're right. We won't see you tomorrow at the presentation if you go down Eighth Ave. Yeah. Um. With that being said, Travis, we know that you know we're cyclic in nature in our profession, but I, I have always thought the cyclic nature, a nature of our profession, was on the ebb and flow of how society treated us. You know, sometimes we're in favor, and then you know, after nine eleven, you know, you couldn't you you couldn't pay for a meal or a cup of coffee mm -hmm. wherever you went, right? I mean, we were at an all time high, um, and then you have a couple of incidents, isolated incidents around mm -hmm. the country that get magnified by social media, a corrupt narrative, and no pushback with the facts right. from law enforcement, um, and, and so. You have a, a, a silent leadership in this. Pro Listen, I, I can I have a little podcast. I, I interview interesting uh, people that are trying to make a change, but I don't have a national platform. I, I, I like some of the organizations that we are members of. And so when somebody says something that's not true. Yeah. What's the responsibility of these organizations? Well, there's um, we've been misled. Because I think most people in this profession believe, well, if you're a national police organization, whichever organization that is, 
man, they're going to have your back, right? They're going to have your best interest in mind. But what we've seen more often than not is, is just like the media has an agenda and the activists have an agenda. These organizations have their own agenda. And oftentimes that agenda does not support what we're trying to do, which was to, it's just to lower crime, uh, support officers, have best practices and policies. In fact, this is pretty disgusting, but just recently, everybody's going to be familiar with the consent decree in Louisville. And it made me sick to my stomach to see all these chiefs sticking their chest out saying, look, look, they did this, but look what we're doing. Like Louisville, like someone could actually stop the DLJ to come into your agency. They can go wherever they want. They don't right. need evidence. All you have to do is read consent decrees to know that. They don't even define pattern and practice in the in the bill that authorizes them to go after law enforcement agencies. They can pull out two use of force incidents out of the thousands and thousands your agency does and say, see, that's a pattern and practice, which when you read the reports is essentially what they do. But when I read the Louisville report, it actually it actually hit Louisville on using lateral vascular neck restraints, which is you watch every weekend on MMA. Rednecks right. are doing it in their backyard right now. Right. You know, I could go to any jujitsu gym in America. They're doing it right now. Exactly. It has not, there's not been a documented death due just to that in the last 50 years. Anyone that will try to tell you that died in an LVNR was, had so much dope in their system. It was not even funny. So right. it's a very safe thing that, but in the ICP consensus policy, two months after George Floyd and a bunch of other organizations, including the FOP and others signed on to that, they put, they made that deadly force. It wasn't even it, until George Floyd, it wasn't even mentioned, but see, George Floyd didn't die from LVNR. George no, Floyd did didn't not. die from a neck restraint. George Floyd did, didn't have a mark on his body. Read the autopsy. Nobody wants to read the truth. So instead of just telling people the truth, they put this in their policy. The DOJ themselves cited that policy as evidence that Louisville PD had a pattern in practice in this use of force is one of the sections they talked about. And that to me makes me sick to my stomach because that's a those are the national organizations that I think everybody on the surface believes, man, they are they are they are putting truth and facts. They're, in they're front supposed of the public. to be vanguards of the truth. Yeah, exactly. And they're playing into this political narrative that they don't need to be playing in. Right. And let's face it, why so many of them are taking money from the DLJ. They're taking money from the federal government in the form of grants. Some of our agencies are as well. And when you take federal government from the when you take money from the federal government, you then have to play by their rules. And so right. you have this hodgepodge of nonsense going on that even our own organizations are sometimes behind and guess who suffers the cops <laughs> on the street the and, people and, that are trying to lead the right way that then have their own like if you're a chief of police in a major city john and an activist says get rid of lvnr you could argue all you want and tell them the truth but you know what they're going to say then why does the icp say this why is why do they say this is the best practice and you're going against it so they are they are hurting us and let's just let's just tell the public what that actually means. If you take LVNR out of lower enemy at force, which is where it should be, because there is no risk to injury or death when you you're use removing it. a, a non-lethal tool. And the only tool you get to put in its place is you got to hit somebody now, right? Right. You take choke codes out of deadly force, which is what they did. Well, now the only deadly force you have is to shoot somebody. So this yeah. does not help the profession. And that's just one example out of hundreds that's occurred to law enforcement in recent years. And at some point, as you said, the roosters are coming in. It's over. I mean, yeah. we, we're at this point where we better get a hold of reality or it doesn't get any close to being better. Right. And just for the listener, the consent decree, uh, some uh, hopefully not all of our listeners have had the displeasure of having the federal government come in. Give us a, a brief snapshot of, of, of what that entails and why. This yeah. is so damaging to the profession. In 1994, uh, in the cops bill that was signed by President Bill Clinton, major supporter was now President Biden, by the way, who, by the way, next time he talks about systematic racism and criminal justice, just remember, he's the author of the 1994 crime bill that put more blacks in federal prison than any time in history because of the drug laws that were in there. So you can believe him if you want that he now all of a sudden cares. But in that bill, there's a section that gave the federal government the right to investigate local law enforcement, run local law enforcement. They found a pattern and practice of civil rights abuses. Now, in that bill, it doesn't say what they're, how they determine that. It doesn't say what type of guidelines departments should adhere to. It essentially was just a political pawn for them to go into agencies, any agency they want. They'll often go in after a high-profile incident 
or they'll go in to any agency they want. It doesn't matter. So you see all these chiefs that are running around going, we need to do this because we want to avoid a consent decree. We want to avoid the DLJ. Well, what they don't understand is you can't avoid it. There is no, there's no rule book that says that they will avoid you if you do X, Y, and Z. And so you see all these crazy reforms because we better do this because the DLJ, well, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, the Memphis Police Department signed on to the uh, that eight is enough reform, you know, that yeah. that uh, that uh, the zero campaign, a bunch of actors together. Well, it didn't stop what happened in Memphis. So no. none of that stuff matters. So you certainly should run a great police department, do the best you can, but that doesn't avoid the DLJ. So the DLJ comes in. They'll hire a couple of consultants to to investigate the department. They'll come to the department. And, and these Those, consultants have a, a, an enormous wealth of knowledge and a strong uh, law enforcement background, correct? Yeah, they're mainly attorneys, right? You know okay. that. Okay, okay. Uh, and so they'll come in and they'll go to the police department and say, give us all your reports for the last 10 years. Give us your body cameras. Give us this. And they'll take all this stuff. And you can imagine the amount of documents they're going to get. And they'll they're pick and choose things in those things. They'll put in a final report that's about 30 to 35 pages. You can go online and read them. And it will say things like, and it's very subjective. They don't get, they won't give you context. I'll give you a quick example. I was up in Cleveland recently, outside of Cleveland. They won't let me in Cleveland, but I was outside of Cleveland and it's consent decree city. They don't like me in consent decree cities. No. And, uh, and this officer came up to me and he said, uh, man, have you read our consent decree? And I said, you know, one time I read it, but I don't remember it. He goes, well, I'm in the consent decree. I said, oh, you are. He goes, you want to hear the story? Well, I, fit, I said, well, you're probably going to tell me regardless. So just go ahead and tell me. Yeah, right. So he says they found a pattern in practice of use of force was disparity against African-Americans. And uh, there were civil rights abuses in their use of force. Very generic comment. And the example they used in the consent decree was this guy's example where him and his partner got a call of a naked man at a grocery store. Shocker, John, no one else came to the call, right? That's a mm. call you don't want it because this guy's yeah, going to be no. watered up, you know, from yeah. the details of the story. So no they go to the either. call just then the whole grocery store is cleared out. These two cops are there trying to do the best they can. This guy's naked. He's irate. He's throwing stuff around and they get a little plan together and they said, and the reason what, why he's naked because he's a ment he's got a mental health issue or cocaine psychosis. PCP body PCP. is burning up inside yep. and he, he's he's out of his mind on yep. narcotics. That's right. So, uh, yeah, he wasn't just having a stroll in the wind. It, right. he, he was he was hyped up on dope. So so they said, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to tase him. And when I tase him, we got about five seconds at best to get him handcuffed. And so they, they kind of get this plan together. They tase him. They try to get him handcuffed. Doesn't work. They end up having to tase him three times, but they get him handcuffed. No injuries. Guy's not harmed. The officers aren't hurt. This use of force reports goes all the way to the chain of command of the chief of police. Everybody in the department says, Great job. You did Give the these best guys you a could. medal. Yeah, the best you could with the re limited resources you had. Nobody's hurt. The DOJ put that in the report and said, see, we told you, you should never taste somebody more than once. This is a pattern and practice of problems in the Cleveland Police Department. So this is the example of the things they do. Now, here's the key, John. They don't build these reports based on actual evidence, right? Because they, they open up the first page of every consent decree and uh, Barack Obama did 15 of them. I think George Bush did two of them. Trump didn't do any of them. But before Biden's over, he'll do more than Obama because this is the way the federal government can take over local law enforcement. See, the federal government hates local government. They hate local control. They want to be able to tell you what to do and you have to do it. But when it comes to law enforcement, this is how they do it because once they implement a consent decree, they put a federal monitor in place. The minimum salary is a million dollars. Louisville will spend 10 million year one. And you and once you go into that consent decree, the monitor has to let you out of the consent decree. Well, do you think if you're making the, the <laughs> Chicago, yeah, I don't think the Chicago ready monitors year. making four million dollars a year? Do you uh, think if you're making four million a year to write four reports a year, yeah. a quarterly report a year, you're going to say, yeah, you've done enough to get out? You're of getting consent. close, chief. You're getting yeah, close. Yeah, Maybe next going. year. So Maybe it's a next joke. Year. Jamaica has uh, been in one for 19 years. Portland's been in one for 12. They're never going to get out of them. But here's the key. These departments are volunteering to go into these consent decrees. The only departments that fight them and say, no, we don't agree with this. In fact, in Seattle, they came out with this report and they said, well, we'd like to see your methodology because they start every report with the first page about disparity. You're using too much force against blacks. You're arresting too many blacks based on the population. They did this in Louisville, John. In Louisville, they said that they're used to force and arrest 
twice uh, was was twice the the level of the population in Louisville. Okay, so I think Louisville has an African American population of I think twenty three percent, and so okay. they were used in force and arrest of almost half the time out of all. So they they use that as the reason of their violating civil rights. But what they didn't put in the report is the homicide rate in Louisville is committed by eighty percent African American. Victims are seventy percent African American, and violent crime was almost sixty five percent African American. So Louisville's is actually less was actually less than the crime. So here you have an agency that when you look at real data and real research was doing a pretty good job because you compare it against crime, sure. but see, they don't do that. And so instead of a department saying, yeah, we don't believe this at all. So we'll go to court and fight you. Everybody that's taken them to court, the DOJ's ran back to Washington, DC, did not impose a consent decree. So they pick and choose agencies that will just bend over and say, please let us do it. We volunteer to mm -hmm. ruin our city and to ruin our department. And so they will pick and choose that. So if they have an inclination that you have your act together and you're not going to step back and take it, that's probably the best way to avoid it. And, uh, and uh, it's just amazing to me that we have leaders, both politically and within departments, that will say, yeah, Come ruin our department and ruin our city because, because listen, John, nobody listening would ever go on vacation to a city with an existing consent decree, Chicago, Portland, Seattle, New Orleans. I could go on and on. Right. Those are the highest crime cities in America. And it's mainly because the federal government ruins the cities through these decrees. And, and is that a way, Travis, for those department leaders to point the finger now back at the DOJ and go, well, it's, it's not our fault that, Crime is out of control where we have this consent decree. Is it one of those situations where they're not they're they're accepting them in, but then blaming them for the problems that are created? Yeah, the problem is you can blame them all you want. The DLJ has the bully pulpit. The DLJ sure. has now told your whole community, this place is so messed up. We have to come yeah. fix it. And they're messed up because of the people here. And and so what ends up happening is uh, they think by bringing in the DLJ that somehow it will make it better or somehow, you know, that it will help us and it ends up destroying it because if you're a chief, you don't run that department anymore. If you're a mayor, you don't run that department anymore. And the deal, I'm going to give you an example in Portland. Just, it just happened last week. Portland has been in a consent decree for nine years. One of the reforms that the, the, the monitor said you must do is you need body cameras. And Portland says, yeah, we love to have body cameras. We don't have the money for it. And the DLJ says, well, we're not buying it. You got to buy it. We're just telling you what to do. So nine years later, they now are about to roll out with body cameras. And the monitor says, yeah, but you can't review the camp, the video before you write reports. And they said, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense because, you know, with human dynamics and memory loss and stressful situations, we want to be able to write the most accurate report possible. We want to watch the video. And the monitor goes, nope. Because when you write reports without watching the video, then the monitor could then say, see your line in the report. It is the discrepancy right yep. there. And so it's just, uh, it's amazing to me that, that we are letting this happen because all we have to do is run a, be a good department. And then when they come in say, you can have our stuff, but we're not willing to do, we're not going to volunteer anything to you. You have to prove it in court. And by the way, just the, just the data I told you on the disparity they would look foolish trying to prove that in court of law because anybody with a brain knows that you can't you can't compare police activity to the census when police activity is compared against those committing crime. crime. We, 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 we look yeah. at crime. Everybody gets that. Everybody understands that. And so uh, so they are systematically ruining. They're in you know 20, 25 major cities now. Before it's over with, they'll try to be in all of them. Uh, I think I think that's that's the next push to do that because when they can ruin cities, when they can make crime go out of control, then it then gives the federal government the words to go. See, maybe we should be running law enforcement in America. Mm. They can't seem to do it well enough. Maybe we need a federal law enforcement agency. And people will say, "Well, Travis, that's crazy because we have the states' rights clause in the Bill of Rights. Federal government can't run law enforcement." Which I said, "Have you not been paying attention?" Mm. Congressmen right now are talking about expanding the Supreme Court. They're telling you it's because of abortion. It's got nothing to do with abortion. It has to do with the Ron DeSantis of the world that they can't stand. They want right. to control these states. They want to control what's going on. And this is how they do it. But we're not paying attention to it, John. And local law enforcement laughs at me when I say this. Oh, that will never happen. 
Well, if I'd have told you what's happening now five years ago, you would have argued with me too. That's sure. the ultimate goal. The consent decrees are just a side door to do that, where the federal government gets to run certain departments. But before it's over with, they want to run it all because then it gives them more power. Because once there's a federal law enforcement agency, during COVID, you ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. With, with yeah. what happened. I mean, you yeah. because you haven't seen anything yet. I, I think people have amnesia when it comes to the restrictions that government imposes on you without any pushback from the populace. Um, yeah, that's pretty scary, huh? Pretty scary uh, stuff. You know, I, I just, this is when I really knew that leadership was in a bad place in law enforcement. People used to tell me years ago, with the cops come to my door to get my guns, I, there's, it's not going to, I said, look, we're never coming to your door to get your guns. What are you talking about? We're right. pro gun. We're second amendment. And then COVID happens. And I saw local law enforcement arresting soccer moms playing with their kids on the beach. And I thought to myself, what is going on? Like there's not one chief that tells a mayor, no, we're not doing that. Just, right. if, just because you pass some emergency administrative law and you're, no, we're not doing that. It's unconstitutional. The, the we whole saw curf local we law had a enforcement curfew. bend over. Yeah, we had a curfew in South Florida. Um, it's and when you look back on it, John, it's so <laughs> embarrassing because it was. First off, none of it worked. But second oh. off, we did it so easily. We shut churches down. We shut mom and pop restaurants down. We used police to do it. But meanwhile, the liquor stores get to stay open. We did. We fell into that so easily, and that's when I knew, man, this leadership thing. We Travis. are well beyond what I wrote about. It's next level stuff, and we better get a handle on it. We were we were arresting gym owners down here for well, letting, I'll tell you pe what happened. letting people, people that exercise. Yeah, people that ask me, and I'm I'm afraid maybe we didn't learn, but I hope we did. We have no business doing that. If a governor or a mayor wants to pass some ordinance, then guess what? You've got health regulators that can go do that. You've right. got administrative people. It's not law enforcement's job to do your dirty business, right? It's right. our job to fight crime and, and to make streets safer. And to me, it was just completely embarrassing what what happened. And uh, it really woke me up. And I thought I knew a lot, but it woke me up. No, to how and, and, and you know, was. The, the more I think about what you've said, we rolled over. We did. We rolled over. And um, <laughs> the, everybody, there was no pushback. Very no. little. No. Very little. And so the things that you're talking about um, in a very scary way are likely to happen un unless we make some dramatic changes in the well, way we do Well, think about things. this, John. Who do the politicians blame when citizens got upset? Yeah. The police. Yeah. They didn't own it. No. They blamed They blamed you and me for the police departments doing that. Right. And so they they use us in so many ways, and we're just not seeing it. No. And, and, you know, and it's funny. So you wrote, I, I, I love the book, by the way. Um, oh, thank you. I'm going to put uh, the links to Amazon and everything in the show notes. And it's just, it, it, it's another perspective. Um, we talk about being loyal to policing and not politics. And, and I know that that's, that, that can be a balancing act for leadership at, at times. Um, what's, what's one way our leaders can can really hold look themselves in the mirror, Travis, when it comes to this 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 dance, right? Because you know we we've got to be real. There, there's a political nature to law enforcement, especially in the higher ranks. Um, what's what's a a tenant or a little tidbit of advice that you could share with the, with that leader who's you know. He's embattled and, you know, right. he, he's, he wants to do the right thing, right? Because we all, in right. his heart of hearts, he wants to do the right thing. Um, and he struggles with that. Well, there's a couple of tenets with courageous police leadership that will come into play here. Number one is facts have got to be more important than emotion. Emotion is, that's all politics is. It's feelings, it's rhetoric, it's emotions. You always have to bring facts. Secondly, the second tenet I would talk about is you must communicate to eliminate misunderstanding. If you can do that against any politician, it's like kryptonite because their whole, their whole life is about confusing people and to use emotion for votes, right? So you have to stick to that script no matter what. And I tell you who does a really good job of this, which is sheriffs. You'll notice the DOJ doesn't investigate sheriff's departments. 
Hmm. Politicians nationally don't really pick on sheriffs. Sheriffs are by their nature political, but guess who they're guess who they they answer to? The people, the community. Is crime being pushed down? Is crime safe? Is can people walk on the street? Can their kids play? So that's their goal. Even though they're a political entity, John. They know the lane to be in. They know their mission. They know that this stuff matters and their job needs to be police work and crime control. And so people generally leave them alone. People don't can't get a lot of a treadway with them. And it's because they stay with the mission instead of being, listen, this politics stuff and all this reform stuff, it's a, it's a bad magic trick. How do magicians uh, do what they do? They tell you to look on this hand while they're doing the trick over here. All this right. stuff does for us is it keeps our eyes off the go. So we're all busy trying to keep this person happy and this activist happy and this politician happy. Meanwhile, crime's out of control. And what we ought to do with chiefs, if we don't start electing them and let them work with the people because the sheriff's model works. By the way, what will happen in the next five years, there will be more sheriff's departments taking over cities because people are going to have had enough with this nonsense. Right. Uh, but what we need to do is, is we need to always focus back on the victims of crime and the criminals. Keep that focus. So whatever some politician wants, whatever they say, does it help with that mission? If it doesn't help, you just have to reject it. Because right. if you if you keep saying yes, well, where are we are right now in this profession, which is why we're here. Yeah, we we are we're pretty fortunate here in Northern Florida. We've we've got some pretty vocal, outspoken sheriffs who look forward to the the, the political confrontation because they do what you just proposed. They stick to the facts, right? They. There's no emotion in what they do, and they communicate the facts effectively. Right. That's, and it's, it's really it's, it's a, that a, simple. A, it, 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 it you is. Know, I think of a, a Grady Judd or a, a Rick Staley here in Flagler. Um, they've been sheriffs for as long as they want to be sheriffs. Uh, David Shore up in St. John's County, 16 years as a sheriff. The only reason why he didn't run again is because he wanted to retire. Yeah. Um, they're doing something right. when That's they. Right when they focus on enforcement of the law, sticking to the facts, yep. removing emotion from the argument and communicating that those facts uh, effectively. And the thing is, John, the vast majority of the community, that's what they want. <laughs> they don't want their police to be social justice warriors. No. They want to be able to go out and drive their car and not go to a restaurant and not get accosted. That's all people want. People, people want to see police as referees. We don't even want to know you're there. We just want to be safe. And if they yeah. know you're there, then that's probably a problem, right? You shouldn't know the referee's name. So yeah. um, uh, people want that. And how our leaders have gotten away from that, it just blows my mind. And at this point, I would think they would look around and go, man, this isn't working. Right. But they're not. They're right. not. They're just doubling down, seems like. And so I think it really is crisis mode. And we look at Peel's principles of law enforcement. Been around since the beginning yep. of law enforcement. Yep. And one of those tenets, right? The test of police efficiency is the absence of crime and disorder. Yep. Not the visible evidence of police action dealing with that. Yep. We've got it backwards. Yep. We do. We do. And, you know, and, we, and everybody wants to talk about community policing like it's some new philosophy. Well, look what Peel says. The police are the people. The people, the are, people the are the police. The police. Oh, no, we need to have a multi-million dollar community police outreach grant from the DOJ. Stop. Right. The police are the people and the people are the police. Stop it. Right. Crime and disorder. That, that's, the, that's the test of efficiency. Hey, listen, if we could change one thing in especially municipal law enforcement, we would fix all this right now. We could say if crime goes up in your city, you're fired. <laughs> Guess what would happen? They yeah, would man. come back to the mission. They would come back to crime enforcement because we know what works, John. There's a reason why crime was reduced to an all-time low in the 90s. We sure. knew that going after violent criminals worked. We knew that putting them behind bars worked. And Keeping so, them behind bars. That's yeah. right. And that's why crime was reduced. And I mean, hell, New York City became actually safe during that I time actually period. enjoyed going there then. Yeah. So we know what works. This is not complicated. We're so far off that it's really insane to even talk about. I'm, I'm surprised I have to talk about it because it makes so much sense to me. Right. There's a lot of nonsense going on, a lot of insanity that I think we need more people talking up about it. Uh, and uh, I join you in that mission, brother. Um, the, the, one of the last things I want to talk about, and it's been, it's even a, a discussion in law enforcement 
Um, I think words matter. I, I think how we categorize our mission and how we refer to each other matters. Right. And, um, you know, the whole warrior versus guardian debate. And, and I think, again, our leaders are not standing up, speaking the facts. Well, maybe they don't know what a warrior is. You know, maybe they never were one. And so they have maybe a, a warp sense of that. But I think if we're going to talk about the culture and changing the culture and reigniting this passion to serve and to take care of our communities, um, I, I, I think the tenets of the warrior need to be spoken out loud and we need to celebrate our young men and women and, and folks in this profession that go, that that yeah. do battle with justice uh, you know for justice against yeah. evil every day yeah it that's another major tenet with courageous police leadership where we let feelings redefine facts we should never let that happen and when you talk about I call it a stolen word. You know, when they talk about warrior, they've stolen that murder. They've stolen that definition. That definition has been around for thousands of years. Uh, we used to embrace that because it meant something. We, we call LeBron James a warrior. We call everybody <laughs> this and other professions, but if you've called a policeman that they're going to try to cancel you, right? Well, the truth is they're lying to you, John. If someone's breaking into that mayor's house tonight, I'll pick on the Minneapolis mayor because he was one of the first ones to start talking about this nonsense. You know, I, I'm banning warrior training. Yeah, you don't even know what yeah. you're talking about. Right. Uh, but if someone was breaking in his house tonight, if he calls 911, you know what he's going to say? I want the baddest mofo you got to come take care of this. Yeah. I, no I mean, if they gave him a press one for warrior or two for guardian, the dude's pressing one all day long. All day he long. wants someone to take care of it. No one was screaming for guardian when these school shootings are happening. So no. it's a lie. The truth is they've stolen the definition. They've stolen the word. And our leaders have been unable to communicate that. They let this happen. And the truth is a guard, you know, they go, I, they, won't, they won't let me go to community meetings anymore because I get asked this question. Are, do, are you, do you want guardians or warriors? And I go, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. they're, they're, they're one and the same, right? Uh, a guard, a warrior has guardian tendencies. A guardian has warrior tendencies. Right. It's a warrior all mission, is actually by its, it's very it's definition. It's all mission dependent, violent. right? Yeah, it's a mission warrior dependent. by its definition is not even violent. A warrior right. is peaceful until it's time not to be peaceful. Right. And so it's, it's just... It's just, it's almost like they had, before this happened, they, they, they were making all these departments in their policy put, uh, put this, uh, um, uh, we care for, we care for life or whatever this little terminology you put in our policy, you know, that we, we have sanctity for life and they would put it into policy to make things better, which I thought, no shit. Of course we have sanctity of life. We're the only ones in many communities trying to keep murders from even happening. Of right. course we have sanctity of life, but all these same idiots kept going, we need to put sanctity of life in our policy. Well, they didn't do anything other than make him look foolish because, of course, we have sanctity right. life. We are standing between good and evil. And so these are simplistic things. If you would have told me that our leadership in this profession could not argue guardian warrior, they couldn't argue thin blue line flag, they couldn't argue. I would, I would have told you you were crazy, but they clearly can't. And here's the problem, John. When you can't get the small things right, and this is a very small thing, you're never going to do anything that needs to be done to really change the profession. That's what worries me about the future. we're getting trampled by the elephants and we're shooting at the mice. Yeah. Yeah. It, once again, it's a misdirection. <laughs> we're, we're worried about, Oh, we can't be warriors. Uh, Meanwhile, bodies are dropping in your city from homicides, right? right? It, it's really, uh, it's good. Call. It's simple to do, but it seems to be impossible for some of these. And I just call them cowards. People don't like me saying that. I don't know what else to call you. When you can't do what's right, you're just a coward. You are ruining your cities. You're ruining your departments. And by the way, we don't need them anymore. It's time to put them out to pasture. We need to build up courageous leaders to change this profession for the better, to make departments better, to make communities safer. That's excellent. And a courageous leader is not without risk. That's that's the whole idea, right? Because there's a lot of good courageous leaders that are out of jobs right now. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. look at even some of the national leaders out there. I mean, my God, they tried to kill Frederick Douglass, one of the, one of my idols, you know, Abraham Lincoln, you name all these guys that really were out there going against the narrative, but that's what we're dealing with. The cowards go along with the narrative. The great leaders of our time, John didn't go along with the narrative, right? They, they stepped right. out and said, listen, I'm seeing something that you're not seeing. This is the right thing to do. And, uh, 
and we don't look back on our history and see that. So we're in this generation now, and I think they're going to look back at us if we don't change things. And they're going to look at us and go, those were the silliest bunch of people I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. Did they not look at the homicide rate, the violent crime rate? Did they not see what was happening while they were worried about their gender pronouns? I mean, I think that's probably what they're going to look back and, and say about us. And um, it's up to people like you and me to, to make sure that that doesn't happen. You know, I think it's powerful, John. I want everybody to listen to this. I think a lot of people are beaten down in this profession and they think, well, what can I do about it? And I think you're a prime example of this. This is what you can do about it. The one person can make a tremendous amount of difference. You'll never know just by you doing what you do, John, how many people that impacts. I mean, there could be future chiefs of police listening right now. There could be people in positions right now that can do something different. And it doesn't take a lot to change this, but we have to act and we have to do it. And we can't be scared for our, our you know, whatever we're scared of. We're scared about our status or, or whatever it is. You have to do what's right. And I'm convinced of this. The cowards that are out there that are thinking they're doing what's right because they're protecting their pensions or they're protecting their rank, they have to one day retire. They have to one day put their head on the pillow. They have to one day look at their grandkids in the eye. They will have no self-respect. They will be miserable souls because they know what they've done. That's a heavy burden they bear because of they their bear. inaction. It's coming. And yeah. by the way, I don't care if everybody in this world hates me. I'll be able to look at my grandkids in the eye and go, I did everything I thought was right. Whether it made a difference holistically or not, I don't know, but you have to do what's right. And I would encourage everybody to stand up and do what's right because there's a lot more at stake than they may realize. I was going to ask you to come up with some final thoughts for our future leaders, man, but I think that was it. <laughs> well, listen, I think there's hope, John, because I think there's probably a lot more people out there that sees this, that understands this than we know. But the problem is, you know, they mute our cops on the streets. People can't speak out. They can't say anything. I mean, hell, I've, they've tried to shut me down for years. I'm still on the job. I mean, they, they drag right. me. They'll drag me in internal affairs. I'll, you know, they'll do all kinds of stuff. They'll, so, so there's a, they've muted the people that are the experts out there so that they can't talk. And so we let people talk that know nothing about it. But I think it's, I think it's worthy to pick and choose your battles, to be strategic about it, and to make a difference, even if it's a small difference. Even if it's, man, I'm going to fight to keep LVNR in our policy because it makes sense at that local level. Then fight for that. Give the reasons for it. I mean, I said during COVID, I said, listen, some of you are being forced to take this vaccine. I don't know much about the vaccine. Who does? But I don't like the idea of forcing anybody to do a medical procedure. So I'll tell you what, if they're forcing you to do it and they're risking your job, have your write a letter. Write, write to the mayor and say, you are forcing me and then give your wife a copy. That way, you know, do your part. Put right. a little pressure on them, even if it's passive. The key is, John, you have to do something. You can't sit back and just go, this is the way it is. Everybody, I don't care what rank you're in, because everybody's a leader. You wouldn't be doing this job if you weren't. You have been you have been tasked and given a gift by God, whatever that gift is. Yours may be speaking and writing. There's may be something else. You have to put that into practice. You have to say, you know what, I'm going to do something, even if it is not doing a podcast or it's not speaking. There's something that every leader can do to make a difference. They just need to do it. And I'm a, and that is really the key. And think about it. If all everybody did their part, it'd be a much different profession. It, it most certainly would. And we would be celebrating and promoting people for all the right reasons. Yep. And, and and that in and of itself would start to change the culture of leadership. It would, it would. So I'm very, I'm very hopeful for this one thing, John, we have some of the best men and women on the planet that are doing this job. And they're some of the smartest and brightest and they care mm -hmm. about people. Once we, in, once we empower them, once we give them a voice, once we put them in positions of authority to make a difference, it will change. The people that are in authority now, they've lost their right. They will go eventually, either now or later, and we get to take their place, and we don't have to repeat the mistakes of the past. Amen. Amen to that. Travis, if people want to get in touch with you, they want you to come and speak to their department, their agency. They want to follow you. Share some of that information with our folks, if you would. Well, Brother. pretty easy. Go to uh, my main website, it's travisyates.org. Pretty easy to remember. And that will launch off. I do a weekly sub stack. You'll see right there the link. You can go to that. I do a weekly podcast. You'll see the link on that. And you can reach me right there on the website. But I'm also uh, uh, a CEO of what I call the Courage Courageous Police Leadership Alliance, cplalliance.org. And that is where we're taking everybody that believes like us, John, 
and we're putting them in one place with all the resources. I mean, they can download the posters, all the stuff that basically that empowers them to do this. So it's great that they can go to your website, they can come to my website, but I wanted a place where we can all be together and all help each other, all encourage each other. And uh, that's what the Alliance is about. So just check both of that out and just get involved. Even if it's just, you know what, I'm going to subscribe to the article. I'm going to subscribe to a podcast. I'm just going to listen. Just get involved at some level and let us encourage you. I really, uh, you know, I think that all that matters. And uh, John, by the way, I, I would be remiss before I get, I love what you're doing. When I saw, found your website, I called you up immediately, as you know, and I said, <laughs> man, I'm I, I love it, man. I love what you're doing. So, and you're the example of a power of one. That's what I keep saying is one person can make a difference and it doesn't take long to look at. You're making a huge difference out there. We need more people just like you. We need to just clone you all over the country. <laughs> I know you get the good and the bad brother. I'm not too <laughs> sure about that. We might want to tweak that a little bit. No, but thank you, brother. Um, thank you for being you. Thank you for, listen, you don't have to be you. You, you, you could, you could just, be out there in Tulsa doing your thing, man, and not exposing yourself to all the nonsense and BS that, that comes with being a strong leader. So on behalf of uh, all the men and women in law enforcement, all the people that you've trained, and, and the, for, to the fact that you continue to fight the good fight, um, we appreciate you like you don't know. Ladies thank and you. gentlemen, Travis Yates, thank you, brother, for spending some time with us today. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Thank you.